great to be here. Um, I really want to thank Anglicare for making it possible for me to come to Tasmania and uh, to uh, really have some time to meet all of you. I just really appreciate your passion for your community, all the work you do to make your communities better places. I also uh, really want to thank the speakers, uh, especially the kids, for some great messages. Uh, yesterday we heard some key messages, and some of the key messages were the importance of collective impact, the importance of scaling up, the importance of collecting data, the importance of the work. Today, I'm here to deliver the rebuttal. So instead of collective impact, I'm going to urge growing 100 flowers. Instead of scaling up, I'm going to talk about scaling down. And instead of collecting data, I'm going to talk about sharing stories. And instead of the work, I'm going to talk about the fun. And I totally agree with the speakers from yesterday. Totally agree. Fantastic messages. But the point is, there are two different ways of building healthy communities and healthy kids. And one of those ways is service delivery, and that was really the focus yesterday. It's absolutely important. And the other way is building community. They're two very different paths. Whoa, what happened here? Okay. And the first path, sorry, you can't see it very well, but the first path of service delivery is really done through agencies. And community building is done through associations. In service delivery, we have different classes of people. We have the professionals. We've got the volunteers. We've got the clients. In community, we're just all citizens. In service delivery, it tends to be top-down, whereas community building tends to be democratic. Service delivery tends to be one way, whereas community building is all about reciprocity and mutual support. Service delivery tends to focus on needs, whereas community building tends to focus on gifts. And service delivery is totally dependent on money. Community is totally dependent on relationships and trust. And as I said, both are absolutely critical. But I think there's no substitute for community when it comes to the things we care most deeply about. First, one of those is just the power to care for the earth. I don't think we're going to be able to deal with climate change if it's just about green technology. People actually have to adopt it. I think people are only adopted if they feel some sense of connection with each other and the place they share. Some sense that collectively their actions are going to make a difference. Taking some responsibility, some sense of accountability. Caring for one another can only be done by community. Preventing crime. We talked about the need for more police officers, but police officers can only enforce laws. Communities can prevent crime. We spend way too many resources lining up the ambulances at the bottom of the cliff when well, community's job is to build the fence at the top. <clears throat> Promoting health. Studies show that only about 15% of health outcomes can actually be attributed to health care professionals. In many ways, our communities can have a much bigger impact on our health, on our mental health, on the physical and social and environmental conditions that impact our health, on our behaviors. Responding to disaster. Both Christ Church and Colby are sister cities of Seattle. So I was in, you don't want to be our sister. I was in both places right after the earthquakes. In both places, they said the number one thing they learned through those earthquakes was there's nothing more important than people knowing each other, being connected with their neighbors. But people often learn it when it's too late. You're certainly aware of that here with the bushfires, the floods. Electronic screens. I don't know if you know Rob, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, uh, advancing social justice. In my country, no major social change has ever happened top down. Every major social change has come bottom up. We're talking about the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, the disability rights movement, the gay lesbian rights movement, the environmental movement, anti-war movement. Every major change has come bottom up. So without strong communities, we can't make change. And our very democracy is dependent on strong communities. Sorry, I skipped one slide. I got mixed up here. But I, just, I thought I should start off by just defining what is community. And I really think our communities are defined by circles of relationships. There's the inner circle, which are our most intimate relationships. There's the next circle, which are just circles of good friends, people we can count on. 
The next circle is circles of participation. People we just bump into on a regular basis in our workplace, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our places of worship. And the outer circle is the circle of economic exchange. Those people with whom we have some relationship because we do business with them. As I said, there's no substitute for strong communities. And yet, at the very time we most need our community because of all the crises we're facing with the economy, with climate change, with our democracy, our community itself is in its greatest state of crisis. How many of you know Robert Putnam's work? Professor at Harvard University... For those of us who believe deeply in community, he wrote the most depressing book you can imagine called Bowling Alone, where he tracks the incredible breakdown of community life in North America over the past 50 years. Talks about how fewer and fewer people belong to the traditional associations, like the Rotary and the Elks and the Lions and all those animal groups. How fewer and fewer families are eating dinner together. How fewer and fewer people outside of Australia are voting And he cites lots of reasons. I've added a few of my own. But one is single-purpose land use. It used to be we'd live, learn, work, play, all in the same village. And now we've created single-purpose places. Bedroom communities where we just go to sleep. Shopping centers where we might drive a half hour to go to the mall. And we're losing our main streets. We might commute an hour to work. And in a sense, we have many different communities... But in a sense, we have no community at all because we don't bump into the same people over and over and over again. Increasing mobility. It used to be generation after generation after generation, our families would live in the same village. How many people here have moved more than five times over the course of your life? Yeah, for a lot of us, it's a lot more than that. If you're always moving, it's hard to build relationships. That's what community is all about. If you know you're just going to move again, why bother? It's a lot of work. Longer work days. More and more people in the workforce working longer and longer hours, less time to put into community. Fear has been documented in many neighborhoods as a key thing breaking down community. Whether or not people have a reason to be afraid, they're living behind closed doors. And the more they're behind closed doors, don't know their neighbors, the more fearful they become. It's fear of the unknown. Electronic screens of all types. Robert Putnam said the biggest thing breaking down community is television. People say they don't have time for community. And yet they spend an average of three or four hours a day in front of the television set. I recently heard a researcher report that young people are spending an average of 10 to 12 hours a day in front of screens of all types. And social media can be a great tool for reinforcing personal relationships. It just can't be a substitute. And for so many people, it's become that. Increase, uh, probably the most troubling thing to me of all is that the very institutions, the very agencies that are trying to help our communities are some of the greatest contributors to the breakdown of our community. Where we have more and more and more professionals doing for communities what communities used to do better for themselves. And where the strength of agencies is they're organized into into silos with their laser-like focus on their discipline, on their function. It's important. But it makes it absolutely impossible to work with communities. We've created one set of silos for young people, with young people's programs and services. We got another one for old people. We got another one for people with disabilities. We got another one for new immigrants and refugees. We got another one for homeless people. And you can't build community in silos. Now our communities are having to organize themselves the way the professionals have organized themselves. Who is serving whom? So I've totally depressed everybody, right? And it gets worse. This is what the... Oh, these slides aren't showing up. This is what our circles of relationships look like these days for so many people. Where they still may have some of the inner circle, but those circles of friendship, the circles of participation are increasingly being lost, and the circles more and more are around service provision. And for some people, they're even lacking that inner circle. My colleague John McKnight, Peter Block, recently wrote a book called The Abundant Community. In there they say, we all say that it takes a village to raise a child. And yet, in modernized societies, this is rarely true. Instead, we pay systems to raise our children. 
teachers, counselors, coaches, youth workers, nutritionists, doctors, and McDonald's. We're often reduced as families to being responsible for paying others to teach, watch, and know our children and to transport them to their paid child raisers. Our villages have often become useless. Our neighbors responsible for neither their children nor ours. As a result, everywhere we talk about the local youth problem. There is no youth problem. There's a neighborhood problem. Adults who have forgone their responsibility and capacity to join their neighbors in sharing the wealth of children. It's our greatest challenge. It's our most hopeful possibility. Hell of a way to start the day, huh? Talked about there's nothing more important than community and it's going to hell. But I'm a hopeful guy, so I want to share some of the lessons I've learned about how to change that. And particularly the role that agencies can play in helping to make that difference. And the first step, I'm going to uh, uh, outline four different steps agencies need to make to be good partners with the community, to help rebuild community, because we do. We need both. We do need agencies, but we also need community. And the first step agencies need to take in order to be good partners with the community, to help rebuild community, <clears throat> is do no harm. The Hippocratic Oath for Community Development Workers. And to recognize that often inadvertently we're, trying, we're doing great harm to the very communities we're trying to help. And here's some of the ways I think we can inadvertently harm communities. And I say we because I've been, doing, I've been working in agencies most of my life, in local government, in nonprofit organizations, University of Washington. First, first lesson I learned is don't distract the community from its own priorities. We spend so much time trying to, trying to um, mobilize the community around our programs, around our services, around our priorities, that we don't take enough time to step back and listen to the community and give them a forum to work on their own priorities. Secondly, don't force the community into the agency silos. Third, don't take people's time without showing results. I think local government can be particularly guilty of this. We're a democracy, so we have to act democratic, so we always have lots of consultation around every program, every plan, but we often always thought through ahead of time, how are we going to use what we hear? And even if we use what we hear, we don't often feed back to people. This is what we did as a result of what we heard. We're very conscious about how we spend our time because we want to be, be good stewards of the people's money. But we often take people's time for granted whose time is, is we aren't paying for. And we forget that their time is incredibly valuable. It's time they could be spending with family members. It's time they could be earning an income. It's time they could be spending watching TV. So people need to see some results, some connection between their engagement and results. I can't tell you how many people we've turned off to community participation. We complain about the usual suspects and forget we often create them. Don't limit the community's role to participation on advisory committees. Don't think of the community solely as people in places with needs. Don't do for people what they can do for themselves. I was trained as a community organizer. This is the iron rule of community organizing. It's the hardest rule for all of us to learn. Often in our desire to help, we're all doing this work because we care deeply about our communities. But often in our desire to help communities, we are doing for communities what they can do for themselves. First week, I worked as a community organizer. I met with my mentor, and he says, Jim, tell me what you did not do this week. So what do you mean I've been working so hard? I've done everything. He says, that's the problem. Your job isn't to speak for the community. Your job isn't to do for the community. Your job is to help build the capacity of community to do for themselves. So every week, I want you to come back and tell me one more thing you are not doing. Don't make the community dependent on you, funding, or other external resources. None of us are going to be there forever. Budgets get cut all the time. Programs stop. But the people keep going. So always think about, are the people going to be better off because I was here? Or are they, going to be, or are they become more dependent? Have they become more independent or more dependent? 
And finally, don't use liability, safety, or other red tape as an automatic excuse to say no to community initiatives. These are all legitimate concerns, but too often times the automatic response is, no, here's why you can't do it. And we need to cut through that and figure out how do we say yes. Because everywhere I go, communities are wanting to step up, but they get to a local council, they get to the local government, they're told all the reasons why it can't happen. So now I want to talk about the more positive moves that, uh, that agencies and professionals can make to work with communities. And the first one is to move from si silo thinking. Again, it is important to be organized in silos. But if we're going to work with communities, we also need to be organized in more of a place-based kind of way and focus on whole communities. I want to give an example of that from Wodonga. Wodonga has an uh, agency that works the local, out of the local church called Neighborhood House. And Neighborhood House is focused on the whole community. They aren't just focused on youth. They aren't just focused on seniors. They aren't just focused on new immigrants. They focus on the community. And they pulled the community together to find out what their vision was. And their vision was, we want to create a healthy community around food. So they brought the whole community together. And, they're trying to figure, and they approached the church and said, can we tear up your grass so we can put in a community garden? They said, sure. So they tried to figure out, how do we build this community garden? And they reached out to a key community association, the Men's Shed. And the men were so proud to be able to build the garden for the community. And the whole community came together to fill those raised beds with soil. And then they reached out to the Mutual Assistance Association for new immigrants and refugees. They got involved because they were able to grow food that was indigenous to their culture. The uh, senior center got involved. The crops grew. They're, and then they realized there was a commercial kitchen in the church. And they said, can we use your kitchen? And they recruited a local chef who volunteered his time and came up with the most amazing recipes. And the whole community came together to gather that food and to uh, process it as the most incredible meals. The women's group from the local church. The high school students from the local student club. And the people from across the street who are labeled as the people with intellectual disabilities. They are no longer the people with disabilities. They are the community chefs and they are so proud. And together they prepare hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of the most delicious, nutritious meals you can imagine for people who otherwise would have no food at all. That's the power of community. That's the power of agencies working in a different way. This is a um, uh, 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 building, uh, it looks like a silo. This is a high rise in our Beacon Hill neighborhood of Seattle for low income seniors and people with disabilities. They were totally cut off from the rest of the single family neighborhood because they had a security system on their door. So nobody from the outside could get in. And because the people on the inside didn't know the people on the outside, they're afraid to go out. So they got the manager to take off the security system one Saturday. They invited in all the neighbors to come up to the top floor to their community meeting room. And uh, all the neighbors were really excited to come because they'd never seen their neighborhood from so high up before. And there was a guy in, the senior, in, the, uh, in this high rise who used to work for the Boeing Company. He was passionate about airplanes. So he gave everybody paper and taught them how to make the most effective paper airplanes you can imagine. And everybody got involved, the kids, the adults, everybody. And then they opened up the window at the top of that tower and they tossed the airplanes out the window, and they had targets down below. If you hit targets, you got prizes. But it was just, and now it was so successful, they met each other, and now they do an annual toss from the tower. Now, every month, they have a Chinese tea ceremony in that room where the whole community comes together. There's a magician in that high rise who does magic acts for the kids every Saturday. And now the people on the inside feel comfortable going outside. People on the outside can get inside because they built relationships. Really powerful when we get out of those silos. The next major shift we need to make is move away from starting with needs. And this tends to be the map of the communities with which we work. We often say that agencies need needs. It's a good thing there are needs in the community or we'd all be out of work. And it's a good thing we have professionals because there's some things communities don't do so well. Right? But often in our desire to help communities, the first thing we do is do a needs assessment to figure out what are all the problems? How can we be most helpful? 
very legitimate exercise, but we've forgotten about the other map of our communities, the map of all the community strengths. That in every community, there are incredible untapped assets. And this is the basis for community action. This is the basis for partnership. Because we're just focusing on the map of what the community is missing, the communities have started to internalize that map. And they're always looking outside the community for all the answers. Then all the power stays with the professionals. We start focusing on the strengths of the community. It really is a partnership. We're both bringing incredible resources to the table. And there's things we can do together that neither one of us can do alone. One of the key assets in er that's in every community are the individuals who live in that community. And what I want to emphasize is every individual in the community has gifts to give to the community. I like to think of them as three kinds of gifts. Gifts of the, gifts of the um, head, that person's knowledge. Gifts of the heart, that person's passions. And gifts of the hands, that person's skills. Absolutely everybody has these. But the problem in our society is that increasingly we're putting labels on most of our population that label people not by their gifts, but by what they are missing. We use terms like homeless. When you think about a homeless person, you think about a lot of gifts. No, you think about what they're missing, a home. I got a friend who's a minister in a church in Cincinnati, Ohio. The members of his church operate a soup kitchen in the basement for homeless men. Finally, one of the members got this idea and says, why don't we interview these men, find out what their gifts are. Turns out, a bunch of these men like to cook. They said, would you like to help cook the meals in the soup kitchen? They were overjoyed. Nobody ever thought to ask them that before. After a while, the homeless men and the members of the congregation were cooking and eating together. And it was kind of hard to tell who were the providers and who were the clients. Because it wasn't about services anymore. It was about community. That is the meaning of community. Everybody sharing their gifts with each other to meet each other's needs. Other labels we use are unemployed, poor person, non-English speaking, where we've defined immigrants and refugees by the one language they don't know. Single parent. And who's got better time management skills than a single parent? Addict. Offender. Disabled. We have more and more people falling under that label. Where we define people by their disability rather than by their abilities. How many people in this room have no disability? I see some eyeglasses. My disability is my memory. It gets worse every year. But when I'm applying for a job, I say, you know, I don't focus. I don't say I'm disabled, but please hire me. I try to think of some abilities I have. And yet there's a huge section of our population that we think of only in terms of their disability. And we miss out on all their abilities. And we just focus on what people are missing. They become clients in a service system. We focus on people's gifts. They become citizens in our community. And I'm not denying that people have needs. There's truth to every one of these labels. Everybody in this room has needs. Everybody in this room requires some services. But I think most people in this room would be identified by your gifts. And most people outside this room would be identified primarily by what they're missing. Because we use other terms to define huge sections of our population, like old person, one I get increasingly sensitive to, and at-risk youth. In my country, we hardly ever talk about young people anymore without that adjective, at-risk. And there's truth to every one of these labels. Young people are at risk. We're all at risk. But it's only part of the truth. And if we're just focusing on that label, we miss out on incredible gifts of young people. Who's got more at stake in the future of our community than young people? Who's got more energy than young people? Who understands technology better than young people? Who are the experts on young people more than young people? Who's got more creativity than young people? 
We're missing out on incredible gifts if we just focus on that label. So I'd like to share a couple stories about the power of lifting off that label of young people and focusing on their gifts. This is in our Soto neighborhood of Seattle. This is a warehouse and industrial area just south of downtown Seattle. Backs of the warehouses were absolutely covered with graffiti. There was garbage all along the tracks. And it's the first view that commuters and tourists get of Seattle each day. It looked terrible because it's how our light rail comes in. Mike Perringer here worked in the local factory. He was embarrassed about this image of his neighborhood. And so he had a great idea. He says, why don't we see the backs of the warehouses, potential canvases for murals? He called it the Urban Art Corridor. But Mike had an even better idea. He worked with our court system, and he asked the judges, could you offer the kids who get busted for graffiti an alternative sentence where they could come and help us to create the murals? Not an easy decision for the kids. It's like a job. You had to show up at work on time. You had to dress appropriately. You got life skills training, mentored by professional artists. But young people create every one of these murals. And we found that as long as the kids were involved in this program, not one of them reoffended. The problem in Seattle is you can only paint outdoor murals three months a year because it's raining the other nine months. So Mike came up with another great idea and got a local warehouse to donate their space. And in there, they create murals on four by eight sheets of plywood. They put those around construction sites to beautify the construction sites. The developers pay for the murals, and it keeps the program sustainable over time. There have now been more than 1,500 murals created through this program, and more than 5,000 young people have participated. Much like the idea that the young people shared with us early this morning. And you don't have to get busted to get into the program. We didn't want to create a negative incentive. A second incredible untapped resource we have in our communities are all our community associations. And I'm not just talking about the ratepayers associations. There are hundreds of different ways people are organized in our communities. But I want to give an example of one neighborhood association from uh, Longgong in Taiwan. This woman here is the neighborhood leader. She's so proud of her neighborhood, she created a map out of uh, fabric of her neighborhood. They had an old building in their, in their neighborhood that was closed. It wasn't being utilized anymore. So the community association reopened it as a community center. All staffed by volunteers. Every day of the week, they take turns taking care of one another's children. They have a cooperative child care program. Really cute kids. They have classrooms, and in the classrooms, they teach their skills for free to other community members. I walked into this room. Hundreds of people were just singing their hearts out in a singing class. Upstairs, there's a senior center, and the seniors are interacting with the young people, and people are taking care of their own elders. And every day of the week, people take turns making food for the people in the community center. It's not institutional food. It's community food. A third asset in every community that we are often missing out on is our built natural environment. Here's a, uh, this is a hillside garden that was created in, uh, from, in uh, southeast Seattle by the Vietnamese community that wanted to grow food that was indigenous to their culture. What I loved about this project was people came together across all generations to work together to build this garden. They had to build a retaining wall to keep the garden from sliding down into Martin Luther King Way. Uh, but they had 50 to 70 people there every weekend working together, kind of like a bucket brigade. Kids, parents, grandparents, all working together. This is uh, where I live now on Vashon Island, small island right off of Seattle. We have some wonderful organic garden uh, uh, farms on Vashon Island. But in our school cafeteria, they were still serving the same kind of food I got when I grew up in, in Iowa. And in, in, in the local cafeteria just served the worst vegetables. They came out of cans. They'd been cooked for hours. I just grew up hating vegetables because of the vegetables I ate in the school cafeteria. So we talked to the superintendent of schools and said, hey, how about if we serve fresh produce from local farms in the school cafeteria? He said, that's a great idea, but we can't afford it. We can't even afford to uh, pay all our teachers right now. And it would cost more money for that organic produce. So we said, okay, we'll make up the difference. And we did a fundraiser. We, made, we raised the money for the, for, to make up the difference. That program now more than pays for itself. Because three times as many kids signed up for the program because the food's edible. And with the economies of scale, we can afford to serve fresh organic produce at a much less cost 
than that canned produce. And it's great for the local farmers. This is a story from our White Center neighborhood, again, about taking an underutilized resource. You are in, Michael, you are in uh, White Center. Uh, White Center is one of the most diverse places in the United States. People there from all over the world. In fact, now their slogan is, White Center, not so white, not so centered. <clears throat> Apologize for that. I don't know what's going on with these photos. They're really... Hard to see, but this is a a Presbyterian church in White Center, and they had a declining congregation and a huge facility. So uh, the church was great. They said, let's open up, make this facility available to the community, because they're right across the street from a low-performing elementary school. And so they have a breakfast program there. They have a before and after school program. Great resource to the community. But the church plant was falling down around them. They couldn't afford to keep it up. But the community felt so much ownership of that facility that the whole community came together. And over three weekends, 1,000 volunteers got involved and did an extreme makeover of that church. They uh, took out the rotting wood. They took out the failing masonry. They replaced the drafty windows with new weather-type windows. This is the uh, before and after school space before. This is afterwards when they got done. This is the kitchen before. It was the kitchen when they got done. Local uh, local artists donated all these stained glass windows, and they re-landscaped around that entire church. And 1,000 volunteers totally rebuilt that church over three weekends. That's the power of community. That's the power of using underutilized resources. It's another uh, uh, facility that was closed. This is in our Delridge community, just north of White Center. And this is an historic school building in that neighborhood. Built in 1917, home of the first African-American school teacher in Seattle. But this school had been closed and boarded up for 17 years. What should have been the pride and joy of the community was a symbol of neglect and disinvestment. Covered with graffiti, boarded up. And so the community came together and said, "We we want to renovate that building again. Make it our pride and joy. And they had a number of sessions about how to reuse that building. And as a community, they voted to create a multicultural center to surround their young people with the arts. They got so excited about that vision that they raised the money themselves to renovate this boarded up building as the Youngstown Cultural Arts Center. They invited in the Interagency Academy, which is a school for kids who had been kicked out of every other school in Seattle. The kids who'd had no breaks in their lives. They brought in the leading youth arts organizations as the anchor tenants. They fixed up the old uh, gymnasium and state-of-the-art movement studio. They fixed up the old cafeteria as a theater. Upstairs in the old classrooms, 37 classrooms, they turned them into live-work units for low-income artists who helped program the space down below with the young people. On opening day, 3,000 people showed up because they all felt pride. It was their idea. They'd raised the money. It was their kids who were performing. There's incredible untapped potential in our communities. Fourth asset in every community is the local economy. Every community has an economy. Just in some communities, it's a lot smaller than in others. John, and the problem is oftentimes in more disadvantaged communities, what little money is there is leaking out. John McKnight once did a survey in a low-income neighborhood in Chicago, found that if all the money that was going to providers and services to low-income people had actually gone to the low-income people. There wouldn't have been any low-income people. So it's about how do we build our economy around the strengths of the people and the place? How do we keep the resources circulating within the community? How do we build on the strengths of that community? This, again, is back in my community of Vashon. We did a project much like the young people suggested. Here's our dreams. The young people said, here's my dream. I want to you know, do makeup. I wanna do... These young people said, here's my dream. And uh, then we teamed them up with a mentor who could help them realize their dreams. So this girl wanted to start up a t-shirt company and got mentored by a local business person who helped her, helped her develop a business plan. Very successful t-shirt company she has now. These young people said, our gift is we're, we're really good at technology. So they started up a technology support group. That's now where I take my computer all the time when I'm having problems. I should take it right now. Um, 
but incredibly successful business. These young people joined forces uh, and, and organized a nonprofit called Save Our Souls. And they're renovating old shoes and skateboards so kids who aren't part of the skating community can be part of the skating community. It's in Columbia City, my old neighborhood. The neighborhood had become totally boarded up through a whole series of community action. We totally revitalized that business district. But one of the key projects was this was the worst storefront in the business district. I wish I had the before picture. It looked terrible. People said, let's fix up the worst storefront. Maybe get other business owners to fix theirs up. Somebody said, that won't do any good unless we get a business inside. Somebody said, how about a bike store? Because there's no bike store in all southeast Seattle. Somebody else said, how about a nonprofit bike store? So volunteers renovated this building in Seattle Bike Works. They got people to donate their used bicycles that hadn't worked for years. And they teach at-risk youth how to fix the bicycles. And every kid who graduates from the program earns his or her own bicycle. They've now formed a bicycle club. They do regular bike rides around the neighborhood. The older kids do the Seattle to Portland bike ride. They do an annual bike swap. So as the kids grow, they can swap for larger bicycles. They've now fixed so many bicycles that hundreds of kids have earned their own. They're donating bicycles to foster kids, to homeless families. They're sending bicycles to people of Africa every year. This is out of a neighborhood that was seen as a place with nothing but needs. Fifth asset that every community has that we could tap to do this important work is our local culture and identity. This is our Eritrean community in Seattle. Immigrant community that was fleeing war. They fled with nothing. Came to Seattle. But immigrants understand community like nobody else. Because there are no nonprofits, there are no local government taking care of people. So they understand the importance of supporting each other. So when they first come to Seattle, the first thing they do is form a mutual assistance association to support each other. They were concerned they were losing their kids to the streets. Their kids were getting involved in gangs. So they pooled their money. They bought an old rundown house in Rainier Valley. They would go after work and fix up the roof, repaired the roof. They put in new plumbing, new electricity, new wallboard. They bought old sewing machines and taught each other how to use them. They bought old computers, and their kids taught their parents how to use a computer. They put a commercial kitchen in the basement. They cooked their traditional meals together. They shared their dance, their music, their culture. The kids are teaching them English. It's been so successful that they came to me and said, Jim, could we get some, uh, I was the head of the Department of Neighborhoods at the time. We had a neighborhood matching fund, and they said, could we get some funds, matching funds, to build a new cultural center? I said, sure, but you need to come up with a match. They came back to me one week later with $30,000. Each household, 300-member households, each one putting in $100. These are people who have nothing. They put everything they've got into their community. And I say, if we all had that level of commitment to our communities, we could take our society to a whole different level. we got so much to learn. From, from our immigrants and refugee population. And then finally, every community has local agencies. And what I'd like to suggest is that every agency also has underutilized resources. It's hard to think about these days with huge budget cuts. But if you think about it, every agency focuses their resources on their mission. And to the extent the resources aren't needed for the mission, they go underutilized. An easy example in my country is the school. A school's mission is to educate young people. So our schools are open during the school day. They aren't open at nights. They aren't open weekends. They aren't open during the summer. They aren't open during holidays. Our schools are used about 18% of the time. How many factories could afford to operate their physical plant 18% of the time? So we got our school opened at night for community use. We called it Powerful Schools. Here's our former mayor, Norm Rice, opening up the school. And in the classrooms at night, volunteers would teach their skills for free to other community members. Very multicultural communities. You could go in there and learn just about any language. My wife and daughter took a class together in sign language. You can take a course in uh, bicycle repair. You can take a course in organic gardening. Just about anything. There's a computer center where low-income kids teach their parents how to use a computer. Cafeteria where we'd have community meals and learn about good nutrition and build community. An auditorium for community performances. Gymnasium for community recreation. And we tore up the asphalt around the school and put in raised beds. Part of the env environmental curriculum, but also a place where people in the community who don't have backyards can garden. And then in turn, the community members got involved during the school, in, during the school day. 
So we have artists involved in the school. Our school district couldn't afford an arts program. But we have an incredible arts program now. We have musicians who volunteer their time. We have writers, so the kids are writing their own books. And every kid has a powerful buddy. Some adult who is praising them, pushing them, advocating for them. Really powerful. Lift off those silos, focus on the community's gifts, all those underutilized resources. And then the final shift we need to make, if we're going to be good partners with the community, is to move from top down to supporting community-driven initiatives. Again, both are important. Sometimes we need to be top down because there's some things communities don't do so well. But we also need to be open to supporting the community's own ideas, their own initiatives, to helping to uh, raise those hundred flowers. And what I'd particularly like to emphasize is the power of youth as leaders. We often talk about youth as the leaders of tomorrow, as the leaders of the future. They are the leaders of today. So I want to give a couple of examples Oh, I should, just want to back up and uh, 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 refer to Jody Kretzman, my colleague, had written Ten Commandments for Involving Young People in Community Building. And the first one is to always start with the gifts, talents, knowledge, and skills of young people, never with their needs and problems. Secondly, always lift up the unique individual, never the category to which the young person belongs. Third, share the convictions that every community is filled with useful opportunities for young people to contribute to the community. And there is no community institution or association that cannot find a useful role for young people. Try to distinguish between real community building work and games or fakes. Because young people know the difference. Fight in every way you can. Age segregation. Work to overcome the isolation of young people. Start to get away from the principle of aggregation of people by their emptiness. Move as quickly as possible beyond youth advisory boards or councils, especially those boards with only one young person on them. Cultivate many opportunities for young people to teach and to lead. Reward and celebrate every creative effort. Every contribution made by young people. In every way possible, amplify this message to young people. We need you. Our community cannot be strong and complete without you. Just want to end with a couple other stories. This is from Limerick, Ireland. They had four social housing communities in Limerick. One is called Ballinacora Weston. Huge crime problem there. Very vicious gang. There had been several murders in this small neighborhood. The government's solution, without consulting the people, was we're going to start buying up people's homes one at a time, and we're going to tear them down and rebuild this community. So one at a time, they started buying up the houses. They became boarded up. Soon they were covered with graffiti. There was garbage everywhere. And with the collapse of the economy in Ireland... There's been absolutely no money to follow through on the plan. So people are worse off than ever. Half the housing's boarded up. People scared to death to come out of their homes. But on Christmas Eve, a young, at-risk, 14-year-old girl named Maeve organized her friends, and they went around house to house Christmas caroling. Incredible bravery. But it gave everybody else the confidence to start coming out of their homes. And there was a vacant lot in the middle of that neighborhood where all the drug deals were going down. And the kids went out and they painted out the graffiti. They cleaned up the sidewalks and the gutters. They recruited their parents and neighbors to help build planter boxes and planted them. They whitewashed the walls. And they painted a beautiful mural. And they turned that problem property into what they call the Garden of Hope. And now, that's the place that's become the bumping place, the gathering place for the community. Rebuilding that sense of community. And the neighbors are going through and starting to renovate those boarded up houses and starting to live back in them again. But it was all led by young people. And one final story. This is in Toppenish, Washington. Central Washington State, breadbasket of Washington State. Small town. And it's where we grow our um, hops for the beer. 
You know, the, the uh, grapes for the wine, the peaches, the asparagus, it's the breadbasket of Washington State. So Toppenish, a small town, is largely migrant workers, largely Latino farm workers. And I got a call from the city manager. He says, Jim, could you come out and uh, work with us on a community development project? I was teaching a class at the time in the Department of Architecture at the University of Washington. So I came out with my students. And uh, we had a fiesta in the middle of the park and said, what, what do you want? Uh, Lincoln Park was right in the middle of the neighborhood. And it was as similar to the park that the young people described earlier. It's a park where the gangs were acting out. This small town had a huge gang problem. And, they had, and this, uh, this park was the border between the two gangs, and it's where they acted out. And they had destroyed all the playground equipment. They had burned the trees and graffitied the trees. Now the parks department was painting the trunks of the trees to try to make them look natural again. They said, we want to rebuild our park. So I, um, I, I tried to think, where are the potential users in the park? And there was this uh, elementary school a block away. So I talked to the principal. And I said, could I have some access to some of your kids? She gave me 100 third graders. They were in this little room. They are bouncing off the walls. It was crazy. But I, I, I gave each kid a big sheet of paper, and I said, draw a picture of what you'd like to see in the park. And think about what's special about your community, about your culture. And the kids came running up to me one time and said, how about this? How about this? I said, invite your parents and your neighbors to come to the church on Saturday afternoon because we're going to put all your pictures on display. We had this huge turnout because who can say no to their kids? We say, Mom, Dad, please come see my artwork. Kids are a great way to get people involved in community. And then we had everybody there put their dots on their favorite themes and images from their kids' artwork. And then I had my landscape architecture students take those ideas and create a master plan for the park based on what the kids had come up with as prioritized by the larger community. And about a third of this uh, master plan was, had an agricultural theme because it's Toppenish. So there was a community orchard. There were community gardens. There was barbecue pits. About a third of it was a traditional Mexican plaza with a kiosco, with the flower baskets, with the fountain, with the benches. And about a third of it was a fantasy playground because I think kids everywhere read Harry Potter. So it had castles and dragons. I said, man, we can't just end this quarter and just have this plan. We need to actually build something in this park. Nobody in my class knew how to build anything. So I had social work students who went out and did an asset inventory in the neighborhood to find out what kind of construction skills were in the neighborhood. We found people who were skilled at building straw bale houses. So I said, we've got to build it. And what, for some reason, what the kids most wanted was a dragon. So I said, we've got to build a straw bale dragon. I just didn't have any idea what it would look like. My architecture students took that as a challenge. They designed a 50-foot-long straw bale dragon. So we went out there one weekend to do this project. All the students and myself were living in a large teepee because this is also the Yakima Nation. I think it was be a one-weekend project. But then the truck came in from the countryside, and I was totally overwhelmed. Just so many straw bales. I said, man, this is going to take us all summer. But the kids were so excited. They immediately ran out and they grabbed their parents and their brothers and sisters, some of whom were involved in the gangs. And they recruited their neighbors. And everybody came out and helped us to build that straw bale dragon. Here they are framing it. Covering it with the chicken, the tar paper and the chicken wire. Coated it. Then we had a color contest and let the kids vote for what color to paint the dragon. Of course, they voted for Smurf Blue. <laughs> and the kids painted it themselves. And then the kids put their handprints all over to show a sign of ownership. And the kids got so excited about the project, they did a penny drive to raise money for all the materials. And one penny at a time, they raised $1,200, enough to pay for everything. So as a tribute to the kids, we built the pennies into the eyes of the dragon. That dragon now has been there for 10 years. Absolutely no vandalism because the community owned it. The community built it. The community takes care of it. And the kids are so proud because it's theirs. Really powerful when we start to see the community not just as a client but as a real partner. So finally, talked a lot yesterday about measuring success. When it comes to community development, I'm a little skeptical about it. You know, we're always asked to measure stuff. And if you're doing community work right, it's kind of hard to figure out, what do you measure? Because if you're doing community work right, it should affect health. It should affect um, uh, resiliency. It should affect sustainability. It should affect safety. 
So what do you measure? And what do you take credit for? I think sometimes we spend way too much time and resources measuring stuff when the money could actually be used to do stuff. I grew up in Iowa, so I love this Iowa farm proverb. You don't make the hog fatter by weighing it. And I like Einstein's quote, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. We're often spending way too many resources measuring the wrong stuff. I kind of like what they do in, uh, they really figured it out in Port Phillip. And there they said, you know, the only thing that really matters is whether or not people are happy. Think about it. What else is important? So they train volunteers how to be smile spies. And they walk down the street and they capture other people's eyes and they see what percentage of people smile back at them. And then they have a formula they've worked out and they calculate how many smiles per hour are in each neighborhood. And then they post traffic signs to show how many smiles per hour in that neighborhood. And it's the only measure I've seen that's actually changing conditions because no neighborhood wants to be seen as unfriendly. So the numbers keep going up. They're up to 10 right at Luna Park. This neighborhood's up to 14. This guy is so happy. (laughs) So in conclusion, I just want to thank you for all you do to put smiles on the face of your community. I think this is an incredibly challenging time, but I think it's also a time of great opportunity to think about how do we do our work in a new way? How do we work not only, you know, through collective action, do better work across all the agencies, not only about how do we scale up because this work's too important to keep really local, not only, uh, but, and, and not only collecting data, but also how do we partner with our communities? Because we need both. We absolutely need both. So thanks so much for your commitment. I look forward to talking with you over the course of the day. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. One for you, one for me. Let's do some questions, shall we? I get this. Let's play play Oprah and Dr. Phil again. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, James Deere speaking with you this morning. And there is an opportunity for you to ask some questions. We've got a few minutes before morning tea. So the routine is stand up, identify yourself and ask a question. It's a very friendly room. Everybody loves the question. Who's going to be first? Uh, hi, my name is hi. Lisa Harris. Um, I guess I'm trying to work out how to combine the things from yesterday and the yeah. things from today. Yeah. A lot of what you've talked about are very individualised examples of communities who have understood their own capacities right. and then built on that. I guess the question is how do we think about upscaling those ideas and those things that work and ensuring that that's not just something that stays localised. Right. Obviously the local context is extremely important right. but a lot of the lessons of what you're talking about have quite significant themes running through them. So that idea about how do you then think about that becoming more broader. Right. I think Meg Wheatley recently wrote a book called um, Walk On, Walk, Walk On and she talks about the importance in doing community work, not of scaling up, but just scaling across. And I think a key principle there is how do we share some of the uh, stories? How do we share pre- principles? How do we take down some of the red tape? Um, what are some tools we can use, like time banks and matching funds, to really encourage more of this sort of bottom-up work? So I, I really uh, think when, when it comes to community work, we can't just take one idea and plop it down in another community, but we can share stories. Uh, and I think, you know, agencies are often motivated by data, but communities are motivated by stories. Stories inspire us about what's possible. Stories get us to think in a different way. You don't have to sit through a day-long session on asset-based community development. You just hear the story. Say, oh, yeah, that's how you can get things done. Right? But those stories are seldom in the news media. The news media tends to focus on the abnormal. Right? That's what sells papers. So I think social media is a great opportunity to start getting these stories out and reminding people about what's possible. I was just in Singapore last week, and they created a uh, Stories on Wheels, a van that goes around different neighborhoods, and people are encouraged to come on and and, uh, record a video on the story about good neighbors. And then they get those stories out in the neighborhood. I was in uh, Gloucester in in the U.K., and they're trying to record 3,000 jubilant stories, stories about people coming together in community. Those stories are everywhere. They're absolutely everywhere. There's tons of stories right here. We just need to get them out. Jim, I'd like to know whether or not, just following on from that question, 
the whole concept of, oh, there's, no, that wasn't a question, that was a stretch. <laughs> the whole question of rolling out one idea right. across another community right. in a practical sense. And how do you marry that with what Michael was talking about, about eliminating random opportunity? Right. Right. It seems to me that random opportunity, one person's passion, is the key in right. any community. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, again, I think it's two different things. So uh, when it comes to service delivery, I think we need to not be so random and, and figure out how do we do that in a, in a more structured kind of way. But when it comes to community, it absolutely has to be bottom up. Uh, you know, I sh oftentimes people make mistakes. I share stories and people get excited about the particular project and they think that's the way to make the difference. So I share a story, for example, in Columbia City where we couldn't get real businesses in. So people say, look, if we can't get real businesses, let's pretend. So we painted all the boarded up storefronts to make it look like they were businesses. People got excited. Cars were stopping. People wanted to get out and shop. Within a year, we had to take down every mural because real businesses wanted to get in on the action. So I share that story in other places. People are really inspired. And then they hire professionals to go create these really fancy window displays. And nothing changes. The reason it changed wasn't because of that particular technique. It was because it was a community's idea. It showed their passion for it, their pride in the place. That's why business wanted to come in. So the, so the key isn't a particular solution. It's more of those principles. And they, can, they can look very different in different places. But, but those things can happen anywhere. Michael McCaffrey is here. Can I ask him the question? See, Michael, yeah. come up and join us, can you? Um, ladies and gentlemen, Michael McCaffrey is yeah. joining us again Woo! from yesterday. So taking into account those principles, how do you see that, marry with your vision of not so much eliminating random opportunity, because you wouldn't want to do that for the magic between people to be taken away, but the whole concept of being able to roll out in a macro sense bits of micro magic. How do you put the two visions together? Am I asking the right question? So yeah. I, I actually don't see them as incompatible. I think this is the complexity that all of us as leaders have to manage. I don't think you get to scale if you can't do what Jim described. See, to me, scale is not just funding a pro program in perpetuity. So when I talk about collective impact, and then when we were in my um, session yesterday talking about contribution, usually the only contribution that we're talking about our service provider's contribution. So yesterday when I talked about that parent that was at a community meeting who was giving all her power away to the professor in the community meeting, and I stopped the meeting because that was problematic, it's for this reason. No one actually was asking folks to come to a community meeting other than to do anything but eat. They actually weren't asking them to come and bring their gifts and solve the problems for their own children. So to me, I can, we all as leaders have to hold changing systems, getting them to behave better, but igniting the collective impact energy of a neighborhood, of individual leaders to want to change their community. And I think the more we can be honest about this, the better off we'll be. So for me, when I'm talking to African Americans, the first thing I'm saying to them is, you know, I mean, think about, because most often other people can't say this because of our racial history. Think about how tragic it is that you keep asking everyone else to come in and educate your children, because you don't choose to read to them. You know, that's problematic. And so part of getting to collective impact at a grander scale is about people own, owning what they actually want to do. And this is what I said in the session yesterday. This is the last thing I'll say, is that if, in fact, a community doesn't want to do this work, collective impact isn't the work to do. If you can't do this localized work, you're actually not ready for anything else. So stop asking for it. And I think the, most, the more honest we are with people about where we are at and what we're really ready to take on, the better. I think the worst thing you can do to a community is fly in and talk about collective impact and results-based accountability, and you don't even want to go and do a community garden. Think about the idiocy of that. The community of garden is where it's at. Once we develop capacities from there, we can keep building and building and building. But we've inverted the process by being too smart for our own good. What Jim brought today is what I hold in my heart, that's why I get passionate about the work, is the common sense approach of how you actually build community and are able to sustain it. Thanks. And I think the other thing is just, you know, I talked about some of the principles about moving from silos to focusing on whole places, moving from needs to strengths, um, uh, supporting community initiatives, getting rid of the bureaucratic red tape, but it's also about some key tools. So in Seattle, we started up a neighborhood matching fund. 
where we provide a cash match from local government in exchange for the community's equal match of volunteer labor in support of projects that have been a community's priority but haven't been a priority for local government. Through that program, over the last 25 years, more than 5,000 community self-help projects have been completed. The city's $60 million investment over the years has leveraged $85 million in community resources that under the old model where people were looking to government to do everything never would have been tapped. But the best value is it's newly involved tens of thousands of people in community life because we've finally given people a way to get involved other than going to meetings. And believe it or not, not everybody likes to go to meetings. So, right? so Mike, it's, it's tools. Time banks are another great one. Are you saying, Michael, what you want to see rolled out is a different form of leadership that says to the community, take responsibility for yourselves. It's not actually rolling out programs. Yeah, yeah. It's not rolling out the program and giving it to them. It's rolling out the leadership. Is this where the two of you are on the same page? Where you have to save yourselves. You have to take responsibility. And it's a different kind of leadership. It's leading by stepping back a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the beauty of this work is when you're good at it, people don't see all this fancy talk. When you're good at this work and you're a master at your craft, yeah. you see the beauty of just connecting with people. I was talking to people yesterday about community engagement. When, usually when people ask me that question, they're asking me, what theory should I use to engage people? And I'm like, wow, that's really fascinating because middle class Americans just talk to each other. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's all they do. They don't need to go have an academic professor tell them how to talk, right? Right. We strip the humanity out of this work, and then we get mad because people aren't ignited by it. They don't want to come to our meetings. They don't want to do these things. And so to me, it is about when we master our craft, I can use all the techniques. I'm holding the community garden. I'm holding systems change. I'm holding being able to measure what is relevant to measure and getting rid of all the stuff that isn't. And no one has to know that I'm doing all that. What they need to be most aware of is my ability to stay in relationship with them and move their agenda, not mine. Yeah, and, and the, too you. oftentimes we're trying to engage community before we have actually built community. Then we wonder why we have the same people showing up all the time. So it, it, part of our, our job, I think, is how do we start getting people reconnected? Sounds like they're showing up because they want the biscuits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's one of the... That's one thing. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for a wonderful session. Michael, thank you for joining in. I think we've married the two ideologies together. It's funny, isn't it? It's the same thing. You've got one, two parallel lines of thought. Where's the common ground? And I think we've found it this morning. Yeah, it's empowering people to take responsibility for change and then supporting them so they don't feel like they're in a nanny state, that they're doing it themselves. Yeah? Yep. Extraordinary. Thank you so much for your attention.